Hello, folks, and welcome to World War II TV and the first show in Arnhem Week. And you may notice this is not a live show. This is a pre-recorded one because of the schedules we are having to work around. And my guest today, his third appearance on the channel, uh, first was on a show about the Battle of the Atlantic. That was all about a year and a half ago. Then he joined me again to talk about the sinking of the Bismarck. And now he is joining me to talk about Arnhem and his book. Uh, 10 Days in the Cauldron is, for my money, the best book since Martin Middlebrook's seminal Arnhem book, which must be 25, if not 30 years old now, possibly more. I don't know. Uh, just a really good, re easy to read understanding of the whole battle without too much going into who did what wrong. It's just about the people and the places. And so I'm delighted to have Ian Ballantyne join me. So um, good morning, Ian. How are you doing? Hi, Paul. It's great to be here. So, as I said in, my, in the intro there, you know, I think your book did a very good job at just trying to tell the battle from all points of view. And I think so yeah. much of the Battle of Arnhem now is discussed from the who did what wrong. And is it Monty? Is it Browning? Is it Urquhart? Is it Gavin at Nijmegen? Yeah. And I think over the years that has taken away a bit of the attention from the actual fighting, the actual sacrifices made, the experience that the Dutch had. And I particularly liked your bringing in of the Dutch civilians, because that gets overlooked a little bit there. It's seen as the, the just the fighting of the British and the other nations there. But of course, yeah. the Dutch civilians were not only caught up in the battle, but they were left to deal with the aftermath over the next few months, because as we know, the Allies didn't return to liberate that area for, for a considerable time. And and we know now that winter of 44, 45, the famines, the, the, the problems with, with just working around the destruction, working around a very angry set of Germans and, and, and yeah. all those difficulties. And you, you try and, and succeed, I think, to, um, to cover all those aspects. And I think that's what we're going to try and achieve on this Arnhem week is we're just not going to have those debates about who screwed up because ultimately – you don't change anyone's opinions. People who are watching these shows and others, if they'd have decided it's so-and-so's fault, they're not going to change their mind because James Holland says something or Peter Caddick Adams or you or I say something. They've got their opinions. Anyway, as a primarily naval historian, yeah, what drew you to wanting to write about the Market, market Garden battle? Uh, I think you gave uh, a clue to that when you were talking about Bridge Too Far because I'm of that generation that uh, went to the cinema in my case on holiday in north wales and sat there actually with world war ii veterans uh, around my family in the cinema and watched that movie and we'd all been greatly anticipating what it would uh, show and uh, so that set my imagination on fire and then when i was a 17 year old i did a walk down the rhine i won a, uh, a sort of a school travel scholarship and we w went from basel to uh, to arnhem actually and uh, didn't walk all of it. We did about three or 400 miles of it, myself and a, a, friend, a school friend called Andy. And part of what we did was to go, uh, because of our hero worship of uh, the paratroopers, the airborne troops, as fired up by a bridge too far, was to go to the famous um, museum at the Hartenstein Hotel in uh, Oosterbeck and um, then sort of trace our own route to what is, of course, not the bridge, because that, that uh, was bombed and sort of fell down. And um, so we did our own pilgrimage. And then, I, you know, that, that's how um, my imagination was fired up uh, many years earlier. But then in 1994, as a defence reporter on the Evening Herald newspaper in Plymouth, uh, I, I did a lot of naval stuff and I'd been away with the Navy in the Gulf and the Adriatic and went to Russia. But when the chance came up to do a special supplement, uh, and I'm in a proper special supplement, on the Battle of Arnhem for the 50th anniversary, I got in touch with a select group of veterans and was very uh, honoured uh, when they invited, some of them invited them into, into their homes. Others I talked to on the phone. And so I was able to put together this kind of day-by-day -day, uh, diary of it, um, of the battle uh, at Arnhem as it unfolded, but from the point of view of a very select group of people. So when the 75th anniversary came up and I was looking for something that would fire me up and excite me and it was one of those stories that I thought was worth looking at and could draw on some of the veterans I'd interviewed that had never been in books. I've done that with naval veterans, but also I had these Battle of Arnhem veterans as well, uh, half a dozen or so, and I decided that I'd pitch that to the publisher and they fortunately went for it so i was able to draw that stuff because i keep things you know i keep loads of stuff notes and 
old uh, articles and supplements. And that, that's what I used as the kind of starting point uh, was that supplement and th those those people that I met. Yeah. And that's interesting yeah, that you use sometimes veterans that hadn't been recorded much previously because mm. I think with Market Garden, the veterans that lived the longest, by the end, they, they had done so many TV projects, so many yeah. interviews, and they were even being asked about their opinions about, as we were saying a minute ago, the who who screwed up, the higher yeah. level thing. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I think that took away the attention from what actually they were doing on the ground because the great majority of people involved in the fighting on those days, and we're talking, this show is premiering when the battle had begun 77 years ago today, yeah. They're not when they're leaning over a stone, a brick wall with a number four rifle, thinking about whether or not there was a, a flaw in the planning at a higher level or whether the airlifts hadn't been scheduled mm. incorrectly. That was the least of their concerns at the moment. They may well have considered that 10 years later when they're visiting their, their deceased comrades in a cemetery. But at the time, all they're thinking about is the, the 50 yards around them in that, in that gulf there. And I think that discussion of endlessly who was to, at fault and how it went wrong has again as i say i'm repeating myself diluted that attention of what the people were doing at the time in the battle who yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and also of course when the battle is raging especially the first two or three days that there is no um understanding that it's going to fail the understanding that it failed came came later on they're still in the middle of a, of a battle but as far as they're concerned there's still a a considerable chance they're going to succeed depending on where you are in a battle and these yeah. are airborne troops who haven't okay the first airborne haven't fought in combat for a while but you know, not since north african italy but they're paratroopers you don't you you know you always win it's the paratroopers that they, they always have the success so this idea of being failure that was a a, a post-battle um way of looking at it at the time it was a battle that was being fought there on the ground in arms so what we're going to do today, Ian, is, is you kind of kind of take us through those ten days and take us through some of the characters that you've talked about uh, and or written about, I should say. So, just before we get going into the, the main body of the show, um, has your understanding of the battle evolved yourself since those first visits? Because you know, like me, you said there yourself, you go there with that element of hero worship, and then as you get older, kind of middle aged cynicism starts kicking in, and you start looking at it and. And understanding it better better is, is are you still sort of seeing it the same way you you were all those years ago or has it inevitably changed um i think the thing that has shaped my perception of it is just sitting with veterans or this particular group of veterans some of them and spending a few hours taking them through their story you have to very carefully as you say lead them through what they did and from their soldiers point of view and I, I'll be honest with you. I, I've, you know, I read a few books. You know, obviously Cornelius Ryan's book uh, was one of them, and also uh, General Urquhart's. And actually, one of the most influential books I read was uh, The Cauldron by Zeno. Uh, mm. I read that at the time because they brought out these tie-in books. So I can't say the perception has changed that much. I mean, obviously, I'm I'm matured, you know, as a person. So I might have thought, you know, oh well, we must, you know, we we must uh, give them uh, everybody a pass on this one because we could have ended the war you know, uh, by making that kind of rapier thrust into the Ruhr. And maybe I didn't think too, I didn't probably didn't think too deeply about that. So I'll be honest with you, it's always been a kind of human element has drawn me in. And then only recently when I've had to return to it, have I had to, as you do with every book, you have to acquire a, a library and a new understanding and assess it. And bear in mind all the things you've talked about, because it's one of those topics along with the Falklands and uh, maybe Dunkirk, but really fires people up still. So as you said, I, I really, back then when I did the supplement and also with the book, although I brought in the picture, the bigger picture where I thought it was relevant, I really did want to stick to the guys. And um, I'll be honest with you, you know, two, two or three years on from researching and writing the book, some of my memory for the detail has been blotted out by other things I've done since. So, I mean, the thing that remains, though, is the guys. That's what I was going to say, the men. Exactly. It's about the people, isn't it? And yeah. that's, you know, yeah. the, the examination of the of the ins and outs is... is yeah. It's the favorite. It's a favorite of the armchair historian because of yeah. that sense that you can sit in a pub and you can say, "Well, don't yeah. do that. Do that. Make sure that gets done." And and suddenly you've you've corrected all the faults and the battle <laughs> is a roaring success. Yeah. And it, you can kind of yeah. lean back comfortably and say, "Well, I've, I've cured it now." And it, it's got that quality, yeah. like that, yeah. like you say, Dunkirk has, or the the third day at Gettysburg, or those kind of battles. Just, just mm -hmm. you can just 
see you see with hindsight the errors made and cure them very quickly but as, as we just said that's not the situation on the ground so by the way folks so we're not in any of these shows going to take you through the entire battle stage by stage drop zone by drop zone we're going to assume people watching this channel have got a good understanding of the battle. And if you don't have an understanding, that you can find the Richard Holmes Battlefields show on, on YouTube quite easily. There's other single documentaries that take you through stage by stage, the lifts, the drop zones, the basic objectives. I mean, I think if I start off by looking at um, a chap called uh, Corporal Harry Tucker, who was uh, just a normal Plymouthian from uh, what was then the slum of uh, the Devon Naval City called the Barbican, uh, and had been brought up in hard c circumstances, who was a Dunkirk veteran, joined the um, the Duke of Cornwall Light Infantry, and then uh, decided he wanted to hit back after coming out of, uh, out of France in 1940, and uh, joined these newfangled parachute forces, and then was uh, dropped into Sicily. Sorry, he didn't, he didn't take part in the drop in Sicily, I got that wrong, uh, but he saw many of his friends killed because one of the problems he had was that his Dakota suffered several hits from uh, anti-aircraft fire when it was going in and so uh, had to uh, turn back but anyway Harry to, to stick to it he's a 25 year old uh, marksman uh, sort of the earth guy who's uh, in the first battalion so he he invited me to his house I sat there for several hours with him and he described vividly how on that day september the 17th he dropped jumped uh, from the aircraft and floated down and could see the people some of the people he said lining the dz um waving up at him and so it was very calm very collected uh went very very well that that first day and he was one of those guys and then they got themselves together and started going uh, on the march uh towards the bridge you know those those eight or nine miles to get there so he was a, a person who was in the passion forces from the beginning and has already seen action and um i think he was full of confidence like everybody else that it would go go well but he would trust the plan trust his superiors and then you know it would unfold however it unfolded so i mean that that's i mean i'll come back to harry mm. but he, he's one one guy who uh, made a deep impression on me uh from from beginning to end of the whole saga uh, and then another one that was uh, going in on that day was captain peter fletcher who i also went to interview um, at his home and he was the glider pilot who has actually featured in books he was in martin middlebrook's uh, book and in fact he had that book when i went around there to interview him so he um he then set it to one side and talked to me about what he was doing he was 29 years old he'd flown into to normandy and uh, suffered the usual crash in his horse and so he was taking graham warwick uh, who was in command of the medical detachment with the airborne division he was in his glider and drops him off and then gathers his kit together and goes off to be uh, an assistant to the lieutenant colonel murray who's the ceo of the first um number one wing of the glider pilot regiment and so he he joins everybody else on the long walk i mean I've, <laughs> funny thing is the thing that amazes me if i digress slightly about um and the arnhem thing is that because the first day went so smoothly and calmly with such, such little opposition uh then it, it's kind of overlooked that the second drop which we'll come to uh, was very much like that er early scene that opening scene on the day of days um episode of band of brothers you know all the flat coming out and the firing and the shooting and that's often overlooked but i mean we'll come to some of those guys um and an another person who you mentioned the civilians i think it's worth mentioning is a guy called franz de soot who's a civilian who lives in Oosterbeck, not far from the old church and he is watching the aircraft or hearing the aircraft come over and uh watches from the distance uh, as the landings begin but the thing that amused me and i thought was a good little um scene was that there was a german anti-aircraft gun crew in uh, nearby in an orchard who were picking fruit were chucking sticks up at the uh, the trees and didn't seem concerned at all so he uh, franz is looking out from his quite substantial villa uh, near near the old church in Oosterbeck, and he sees these guys and uh, they seem very unconcerned but within a few a few moments or a few minutes they've disappeared so he realised that something important is up. You know, there's a lot of activity going on. So he's another character in the book who obviously we'll come back to. But um, for me, it was important to get the civilian perspective uh, in there. And the fortunate thing was that through my contacts in the uh, 
in the in the museum there uh, i was able to get um a transcript of his account mm. uh, diary account of, of what happened so he's uh, he's another person I, i'd like to bring in and i think just worth mentioning we talk about the confidence of the British Airborne Division going into that because of their experiences, both the sixth Airborne, first Airborne, and Airborne forces generally, of, of there's not much in the way of failure behind, but it's only been success. But also from the Dutch point of view, I mean, as I do living in Normandy, the, the Normandy yes. jumps in June, which you just referenced there, yeah. were mostly terrifying for the French locals here because it's in the middle of the night. It's absolutely yeah. without any warning yeah. whatsoever. They, everyone knows yeah. there's going to be a second front, but no one knows it's Normandy. And you're, you know, you're seeing in the middle of the night, black painted, face painted paratroopers yeah. that you don't yeah. know what nation they're from, just terrified. Of course, when we get to Market Garden, the Dutch people, some of them have been listening to the BBC, they're aware the British Army has has raced across mm-hmm. Belgium pretty quickly. Yeah. And and, and yeah. since that closure of the Falaise pocket, things seem to be very much going in the Allies' way. They've seen, as we know famously from the beginning of Bridge Too Far, the German army seems to be in full collapse and disarray. So when we talk about the confidence of the British Airborne Division, the confidence of the Dutch civilians when they're seeing this, it's, it, it's in daytime, they've got time to take it in. It's a spectacle because of this yeah. uh, overwhelming number of aircraft you're seeing. And, you know, if, yeah. we always think about those people on the, you know, the coast of England seeing this armada fly out, mm-hmm. which was just monumental in size, yeah. thousands of aircraft and gliders. Yeah. And if you're a Dutch civilian or an English civilian watching that head out there, your feeling of my God, we've got all this power at our disposal, and we're sending it. And how th- this is going to be amazing. This is probably going to yeah. the old cliche end the war by Christmas. It's it's yeah. not for these Dutch people. Obviously, they're 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 going to be nervous about war coming to their their very very backyard, but it's still offset with this general confidence of what the Allies have been doing over the previous weeks. Yeah, yeah, and I mean another another person who from the beginning, you know, on the seventeenth of September, who who was part of that um, um, and part of the narrative is was fourteen year old boy at the time was Jan Luce, who to this day is a battlefield guide there, and he very kindly uh, let me see uh, his account, and then we worked together uh, mainly via the internet and emails, and I translated using the magic of Google Translate uh, <laughs> his Dutch account, and then I enlarged upon it, and Jan uh, tells how. He was living in a house that was uh, a matter of yards away from the Hartenstein Hotel, which would become the HQ of the 1st Airborne Division. And he he does tell that story himself of how he and his pals uh, were, were eager to get out there and, and greet these liberators as they came in. And, of course, there's the other uh, he conveys, and so does um, Franz de Sot, uh, the, the amazing jubilation of the Dutch people. It was like a carnival as they saw the British troops coming coming down from the drop zones, the landing zones through and, you know, and, and like it shows in a bridge too far, you know, g- going out there with uh, drinks, uh, water, you know, a bit of fruit, whatever, and greeting them. And uh, and Franz uh, uh, recalls how they were posing for the equivalent of selfies, you know, getting people to take photographs of themselves, the British troops, as they went in. So there was this kind of carnival atmosphere. Um, but then there's a chilling, a chilling effect creeps in even in the uh, on the first evening you might say as um as things shape up when the germans kind of spring back from their shock at all these uh, uh, allied soldiers descending upon them and uh, jan um, recalled that he went out with his um friend uh, to go and look at uh, some german soldiers that had been shot because he'd never seen uh, there'd never been any combat there so he'd never seen anything like that and he found it quite uh, disturbing, of course, and strange to see actual dead Germans, a few of them lying on the ground nearby. And then they heard of, um, uh, one, I think, one or two locals, I mean, you can read the book, it's all in the book, it's all the details in the book, uh, were actually shot uh, early on for cooperating uh, with the British. So I think fairly, I think the optimism lasted quite a few days, but I think there were signs filtering through uh, right from the beginning that um, the jubilation was something that they might have to temper. But certainly mm. it was a celebration. <clears throat> John Frost memorably uh, recounts he had to keep going and, and avoid stopping uh, stopping his battalion, 2nd Battalion of the Parachute Regiment, and keep them moving on that on that first day. And, was, uh, and there was this bit which I've got in the book where one of the officers uh, threatens to uh, shoot somebody if they uh, 
take, I think it's take any alcohol off this uh, mad Dutch person who's cycling up and down on a, on a bicycle. So that, that jubilation was in fact a uh, potential impediment to a successful completion of getting to the, the main bridge, because there was more than one bridge, obviously, um, to the road bridge on that first day. And I think it's it, it's odd in the sense that, as you said, that in Market Garden, the apparent liberation came first, then the battle. Yeah. Because mo most yeah. ways it goes the other way. You know, the, the battle yeah, yeah. first, then comes liberation. Of course, we now know that false hope of liberation. It wasn't yeah. a liberation. It wasn't. Yeah. A, you know, but yeah. And I think, again, with the armchair generals, you can see even from the first few hours when it was appearing to go well, that there were already yeah. little things yeah. biting into it that were going yeah. to have this snowball effect, domino effect later on. But yeah. Yeah, you, you obviously, an airborne soldier knows that not every element of an airborne drop is going to go perfectly. None, none of them had started well. We've, we talked about that on, on Airborne Week a couple of weeks ago on, on World War II TV, you know, Operation Mercury for the Germans in Crete, to the Russians in Vyazma, the even the, the Allies in Normandy, you know, dispersal of jumps, lots of equipment. But then the momentum seems to go in the favor of the jumper as they get their equipment again, they get their groups together. And this had the opposite, as we just said. It, it, the jumps went really well, and then it began falling apart although yeah. you didn't necessarily notice that on the ground. And when you were talking to the veterans, the Dutch yeah. people, because you're talking to them having known at the end of it that it did end mm. badly, mm. do you sometimes think that because they knew it ended badly, they are adding yeah. the disaster earlier in the story than it actually came when they were living it, if that makes sense? Yeah. I mean, it's quite, it's quite a common thing. And, and as a historian, you have to be... Uh, careful of this in uh, um, when you talk to somebody you you have to obviously go with the good knowledge of what happened during, whether it's the Bismarck action or uh, a sea you know another sea battle or or the Arnhem thing or D-Day and then you kind of sit down with them and you bear in mind that factor the the rewriting in their own heads because they will have seen um they will have seen films and they will have read books as well so you have to know yourself what it's likely that they are revising because as you say they've they've read it uh, in the aftermath so you're right that does does affect them but what my my technique and, and not just um arnold veterans but others uh, dozens of others is to sh very gently take them through uh their experiences what they felt what they saw and also what they experienced at the time and sometimes you have to circle around and come back to it you know and you have to be careful what kind of questions you asked and then and it can take quite a long time um so i mean with somebody like harry uh i remember i arrived when it was like mid-afternoon I, I didn't leave until you know it was almost getting dark so you have to gently go through it and hope not to wear them out too much um and so yeah you're right there is there is a mm. little element of that but you can with knowledge filter that out and i it's, think it's, yeah it's an ability yeah. to kind of head them off at the pass in that you know you know you yeah i've done yeah. it myself with arnhem veterans a couple yeah. of few yeah. that i've interviewed where they will they will yeah. add and of course we know now that frost had lost the bridge yeah. and you say well yeah. you didn't know that at the time though did you where you were you didn't yeah. know that this event yeah. had happened elsewhere you you were still at this point yeah, yeah. continuing well, your yeah. battle as if that hadn't happened they go yes of course i didn't know that and that that's the the wonderful thing about if you can find that pure veteran that hasn't been kind of tarnished by doing other interviews is they should kind of tell you just their experiences and they don't try and tell you someone else's that they read about because that yeah in a sense, is a recipe for disaster. And then I want your story, your perspective, yeah. your yeah. unique view of it. Yeah, and I think the thing that um, is a good, was a good early indicator, certainly just taking a quote or just in what uh, I think it was Captain Fletcher, Peter Fletcher said to me, was about how, and I think Harry said this as well, um, that they were pausing, they were stopping, and it was stop and start on that first day as they were meant to make this, you know, swift advance, you know, by, on foot straight down to, uh, you know, the um, the railway bridge and then on to the, the road bridge and all the rest of it, which we, we won't go into the detail here. But the thing is, you know, Peter uh, Fletcher says, you know, had time uh, to pop in and, you know, have a shave, you know, at a house, you know, and... Uh, so the fact that you're having time to stop at a, a local resident's house, pop in and have a shave is a sign, I think, that um, maybe things are not going right. At the time, though, it might feel that things are going really well. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, the the reverse effect is happening. Yeah. Oh, look, yeah. it's going so well. I can actually stop and have a shave. But again, with the benefit of the hindsight, you're realising, hang on, it's because there had been delays and those delays are kind of pushing their way back down the line. Yeah, and um, of course... Uh, something that I obviously I did research, additional research 
the Imperial Museum Sound Archive and also via the, the wonderful Airborne Forces Museum over at Duxford. One of the things that uh, Brigadier, then Brigadier Hackett reflected upon was the fact they were so eager prior to, you know, September the 17th, after all those uh, misfires in terms of operations, so eager to get these amazing troops, these incredible troops that would soon go off the boil into action. It was a sort of an eagerness that may have over, overcome on, on the day of the match, some of the, the little niggling things that perhaps worried some of them. Mm. It would have been to get on with it and do something, having watched the collapse and the uh, and, and then the pursuit, the collapse in Normandy, as you say, the fillet's pocket, and then the pursuit, an amazing pursuit to uh, the Belgian uh, Netherlands border. Uh, it would well, we, we want to get in on this, and that's why I suppose and uh, they were hoping that they would get the same thing that the Germans would just collapse. And of course, we know they didn't. Because they have this amazing resilience and ability to just form, form um, up. It's a bit like the Terminator, isn't it? It's a bit like Arnold Schwarzenegger in the Terminator. You know, the mercury comes back together, yeah. melted stuff comes back together and forms up again. And the Germans were. Yeah. We have to, you know, we have to acknowledge they were good at the yes. improvised battle group. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. fling a few anti-aircraft guys, yeah. a couple of anti-tank yeah. units, some yeah. infantry, some yeah. pioneers, a couple of armored cars, and boom, you've got that little unit that can do a, a whole lot of damage. We, the British and the Allies, don't seem to have that ability um, no. to bring that together. I mean, James Holland says that's actually a sort of a weakness of the Germans in that they haven't got the large forces, and because they're not hampered by having so much stuff, that their ability to throw these things, it looks like it's good, but actually it's a, it's a sign of their overall yeah. weakness. But yeah. of course, when you're yeah. a parachute regiment, yeah. lightly armed company on your way yeah. to the bridge and you're suddenly now meeting an improvised battle group with armoured vehicles and armoured cars yeah. and machine guns, yeah. it's a real threat to you. And I think also a good point of what you said there about Hackett is we did the show with James Daly in Airborne Week about those cancelled operations between Normandy yeah. and Market Garden. And when we assess the flaws of the market garden plan. Some of these earlier plans were even more ambitiously ridiculous, you know, and you think if they've seen some of these earlier ones, in by comparison, the market garden plan actually seems reasonably sound. So, you know, you can completely understand the enthusiasm of these guys, especially people like you were saying, Harry there, who've been at, you know, Dunkirk. They've got the experience of knowing how good they are as airborne souls. They know they can fight themselves out of all sorts of issues. And even if things, you know, the Sicily jump didn't go well, but they, you know, the, the success was there at the end. They're brimming with confidence. And when you're that fired up, it's difficult then when things are falling apart around you to admit to yourself, perhaps, that hang on, this isn't going quite as well as we thought it was going to. It's, uh, it's, yeah, yeah. it's human nature, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, th I think there's two, um, there's two, I mean, there's two things about the, Ger the German groups that would, you know, very quickly be formed up. I mean, some of them weren't as uh, almighty and formidable as, um, I think that's what James Holland was basically suggesting in a way. In a lot, a lot of these groups, as some of the soldiers would witness later on in the battle, were reluctant to fight. They were composed of sailors and people that were grabbed from anywhere, so they weren't actually much good. And then on the other hand, some of the air, you know the airborne forces you you mentioned there obviously were, were highly highly seasoned, you know, well seasoned and fought elsewhere, North Africa, um, Italy, Sicily. But some weren't, and some were very new to it. And of course, some of those people are in the um, in the book as well, you know, as it, as it progresses. And they basically didn't have much of a battle at all. I mean, I think on the uh, on the 18th, I mean, uh, we're talking about signs and things like that. I think that on the 18th, um, really the night of the 17th was the uh, was the decisive moment, you could say, to get through. And this is something that, you know, is reflected upon in the book. Uh, and again, it's hindsight, of course, you know, a lot of it. it was the night of the 17th that when some people paused, you know, some battalion paused. The second battalion got through with all with a few of the other uh, other units and other people. Uh, but it was the pause at night of the. And I think John Frost was very frustrated by this in in retrospect or at the time. The pause that there was then uh, fatal for for breaking through because that that um, steel wall uh, was being formed by the Germans between the uh, paratroopers, the airborne troops, uh, the. Airborne infantry and the paratroopers in the town, and those at the bridge. And one of the people on on the 18th, one of the people that is involved in that is uh, a young paratrooper officer called Lieutenant Richard Bingley, from again from the first parachute battalion, who did fight uh, in Sicily and was shot through the hand in Sicily. And this is I've got a little story to tell here, which is one of the most amazing that I I found um, in the archives of the Airborne. Forces Museum, um, and then ends up in a grapple to the death. But the thing about him was he was in command of 
6th platoon in the S company of the battalion. And uh, as things uh, roll on or develop on the 18th, he's called forward by uh, the battalion commander and said, I'd like you to get as much ammunition as you can and get chaps together and these three brain gun carriers and then race for the bridge, break through to the bridge. And uh, unfortunately that, that goes awry when in a, it's a quick succession, the brain gun carriers are blown apart. So he's then sent to still try and get through with ammunition and with some, some people, gather up some of the people that have become scattered even by the 18th in the town and then go for the bridge. So he, he gets a couple of people to help him call people in from houses. And that was one of the features, of course, of the battle was the fragmentation of units mm -hmm. in the urban environment. So they gather together some people. And it's while he's gathering together some that he wanders off without his bodyguards and uh, encounters uh, a German a soldier uh, climbing down over, I think, a hedge or a fence into the street. And then with his still injured hand, unfortunately gets involved in this grapple to the death with this guy, uh, which he just wins uh, by, by unfortunately, you know, it was a terrible way to um, deal with the enemy, but using his, um, his very uh, pistol to come out on top. But, I mean, he then staggers back to the, uh, to the battalion and reports that he's had this incredible um, incredible encounter in which he nearly lost his life and he's given some uh, cherry brandy by a, a russian speaking officer in the battalion but that sort of uh, whole process from getting into the town being told by it was colonel doby the lieutenant colonel doby that told him to take the brains forward with ammunition see what you could do to get through with some troops then that failed it was soon shown to be an unwise plan and then also uh, trying to gather people together when uh, although it was a single combat fight that showed that you know that there were germans there that would fight to the death and weren't just going to melt away and uh, thereafter he and his soldiers got involved in um, basically doing urban combat and going through houses of course because the streets were just a, a kill zone and um, he eventually ended up you know uh, injured again uh, and captured so on the 18th you know you've got desperate attempts um, to get through to the bridge, which basically uh, it can already be seen that they're not going to succeed. And Harry Tucker is one of those that also tries to get through uh, along one of the streets to the road bridge and actually sees it. But then a, a German flamethrowing uh, tank or armoured vehicle appears ahead of them and they, they end up in a headlong retreat because they just can't suddenly realise that this is more than just, you know, the, um, the much vaunted old men and, you know, people on bicycles. So... Uh, I think by this stage, uh, things are really kind of solidifying into uh, not being an attempt to take over bridges, but being an attempt to uh, hold off the enemy and keep the division in sort of some kind of fighting order. But I think that's something that your book does well about that second day and maybe even nudging into the third day, the 19th, is the, the overview narrative has already switched the battle to being defensive overall, yeah. isn't it? Because yeah. it, you know, they're, they're holding the drop zones, waiting for the next lift. There's yes. frost the bridge holding. But of course, yeah. you know, the people yeah. like you just mentioned, yeah. they're still on the front foot on the 18th. Yes. Okay, it's not. We're now seeing that none of these efforts are really getting anywhere. But I think so many, when you read the big books, we're now defending. Everyone's holding their little perimeter. Now, that's later in the battle. That, you know, yeah. Later, of course, it becomes firmly defensive. And you have that yeah. thumb-shaped perimeter around Lusterbeek, and you have the Recce Corps there, and the Cosbys are there, and so. But that, but on, on that second day, there's still these. Uh, what we now know, of course, is that there's not enough coordination and communications between these little elements, and and trying to follow it. And it's why, why folks, we're not we really putting maps up at this point, particularly because you could plot 50 different little actions happening on those three routes towards the bridges where there's a platoon doing a bit here, there's half a section doing something there, there's a, a part of a company doing that there. And alas, half of these units were unaware of where the others were at the time. And while one little unit is making a little advance, the other unit are actually taking their breather at that moment. And then when they're doing their advance, the group that's done their advance are taking their breather. And if only with hindsight there could have been more of a coordination between these advances, the battle still might have turned. Because yeah. as you say there, that steel yeah. wall the Germans are, yeah. Yeah. are physically building was not, it was still, it was strong, but it was still, I think, had gaps that second day that maybe could have been capitalized with a few things falling into place. And of course, everybody is still holding on to that idea of 30 Corps arriving, that golden goose 
of the arrival of the Allied armor coming up Hell's Highway that, again, of course, when you're talking to veterans, or when you were, they now know that they're stuck however many miles down the road, but they didn't know that at the time. You know, that, that famous mm. bit in the movie when they hear tanks and the first reaction is, yeah. well, there are tanks. And he realizes, yeah. oh, no, they're not our tanks. Yeah. They're the enemy tanks. And that, I think, symbolizes that at the time, the belief 30 Corps would arrive and save the day was absolutely in the heads of pretty much everybody in the 1st Airborne Division. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you're, you're right. And... Um... Uh, that's why, of course, that they would on, on on the 18th carry on flinging, you know, troops in to try and um, make good on what they'd done already. And I mean, without digressing uh, too much into it, I mean, of course, you know, Major General Urquhart was uh, missing. But I mean, one of the uh, incredible stories, as we uh, touched on earlier, was the second um, drop, you know, into uh, basically uh, hellfire on the 19th, which, uh, of course, wasn't conveyed in a bridge too far uh, because I think a lot of things were going to be put into a bridge too far concerning the British fight, from what I understand from William Goldman's original script. But as it went on, they had to appeal to an American or a more uh, multinational audience. So a lot of the uh, VC exploits were, were sort of whittled out and, and taken out. So, of course, you know, no nobody that um, understands the story via that movie uh, alone would would know that there was this um extraordinary drop on the 18th which and then one of the one of the guys accounts that i got was uh lieutenant jeff noble who's a very young uh, officer in the 156th parachute battalion whose whose aircraft basically he was a machine gun officer and they were split over two aircraft and then the one he was in it took off for the second the second drop and um one of the containers on the bottom actually came away and was dangling behind the aircraft and his extraordinary um, account he gives um in, again in the archive uh, i can't remember if this was the imperial War museum or the airborne forces archive uh, he, he recounts how uh, they were trying to get rid of this container that was flapping around dangling and trailing behind the dakota so they actually were holding a, a, a guy by the feet and he had almost what amount, I think he was trying to do it with a rifle with a bayonet on, try to cut it away. And so they were desperate to get into to action and getting this, you know, trying to desperately cut away this container, but they couldn't seem to do it. So the, the American pilot of the Dakota turns it around, lands at a B-17 airfield, and this thing is bumping along the, the runway behind them and says, well, that's it. We've missed, you've missed Arnhem, basically. You're not going to get into battle. That's it. Uh, but then these air engineers from the B-17, one of the B-17 squadrons come along and say, no, we'll help repair the aircraft because the aircraft's been a little bit damaged. And then they persuade the Dakota pilot uh, to take off and they catch up. And then he he basically has gone through all this effort to get into action. And when they get there, they find that the Heath, you know, the DZ is uh, there's Germans and the Dutch SS firing at them, trying to pick people off of the doors as they jump. There's uh, the Heath's on fire, and they they even then they sort of they're so eager to get in, they're jumping out into this um, hellfire down below. And um, and unfortunately for him, you know, in the end it was a very frustrating experience, and he ended up uh, being captured after not doing very much. But the other side to his um, machine gun platoon, they their their Dakota actually crashed. And they were all killed. So it is extraordinary when you read these stories, you know, at such distance, how um, the efforts that somebody like uh, Noble would go to to get into combat, and that goes back to this idea they were eager to do something. Yeah. But then the sort of um, the chaos that they were then plunged into, and some of them lost their lives fairly quickly. But even that, you know, didn't make them give up. As you know, we know from from the story, and as I relate in the book, you know when Brigadier Hackett uh, gets on the ground and then goes to um, see uh, the temporary division commander, they have this argument about what's going to happen to his his battalions, and of course, you know he's expected to take his uh, brigade and go in a coordinated fashion, pushing out and round and down towards the bridge, and he says, "Well, no, that's uh, that's not going to happen." You know, and again, with with the benefit of hindsight, you can say, okay, just make sure when you go in there, there's a clear 
seniority system yeah. and it's you, then you, then you, then you. But at the time, yeah. there was a bit of an uncertainty about that. And that story you yeah. said about the, the, the drop zone being hot is, of course, a double blow for the first airborne division because, yeah. one, they'd yeah. left so many of the people there defending that drop zone that could yes. have been being used to move the bridge. And then when they do hold it, it's a hot jump and then more people are killed there. And so you're, it's a double blow to the overall success there. And again, yeah. it goes back, you're talking about the movie, not that we're pulling apart the movie. The movie typically has that kind of one progressive narrative timeline. So once it's done the drop zone scenes, it doesn't go back to drop zones because it's kind of showing you a linear a linear yeah. A, a yeah. story, which yeah. which makes sense from the point of view of a movie. But as you're quite right, I think has, has, has allowed this idea of the second jump being yes. so contested to yeah. kind of fall yeah. away a bit. So that that's... Um... That's why I guess I was so um, interested and excited. Uh, it may be the wrong word, excited, but determined to get in something that told the graphic, you know, story of that second drop from the point of view of the people uh, mm. jumping in. And, uh, uh, and, and ultimately, the, the, the point we're making is is that the the graphic nature of these individual stories you yeah. wrote write about are unchanged, regardless of whether or not someone has made an error higher up. It doesn't. That doesn't yeah. change how dramatic the individual story is whether there's an, whether there's some um a portioning of blame that should be done is irrelevant to those people there going through this the fact that your crew there are getting a b-17 engineers to repair the aircraft to go yeah. back in there shows you yeah. the determination of the airborne yeah. story and also as you said there yourself this there's almost a sense that when it starts going wrong when you've had a couple of buddies killed if you then take your foot off the gas and backpedal a bit you're making their death seem for nothing so in a way it just galvanized the spirit of the airborne division once you see people dying around you to keep on going and make, make sure their deaths are are leading to a victory because so yeah. it, it, yeah. it just and sort like, of makes it worse yeah. in a sense yeah yeah and i mean uh, it's, it's interesting i know we, we're harping on about the uh the movie a bridge too far probably a little bit too much because but i think it's important uh although that isn't what the book is all about to get in people who maybe were a little bit misrepresentative and this could take us to september the 20th mm -hmm. uh, if, if i'm if i'm allowed if we can race ahead a little bit you know yeah um in it's uh, major tony dean drummond is an amazing and famous character if you read into the battle and its aftermath but when you see the movie um and i can't remember the name of the actor but there's that famous scene where sean connery is uh, on, on the drop zone and there's the jeeps in the background with the radios in and then you've got the people from the asylum who are wandering around and he according to the movie narrative he's starting to get a bad feeling about this and then the poor um, unfortunate radio officer um, is explaining how the radios don't work and that is meant to be tony D dean drummond tony dean drummond and um i think i i mean i i didn't know that much about about what he did before I wrote the book, but it was fascinating to get into the story of the reality there without going into the technical detail on the radios, which I've explained as simply as I can in the book. But he he had such a, a big story from beginning to end, and he was sent forward to try and sort out the radio problems, which of course isn't seen in the movie, and ended up going down um, with uh, paratroopers to the bridge, uh, to, sorry, towards the river, and ended up in a big fight and actually ended up in command of some uh, paratroopers. And they, when everything fragmented, uh, ended up in a house, fighting from a house. And then when they realized they were surrounded and outnumbered, they went down into basically uh, a downstairs, uh, sorry, into a lavatory of the house, a big lavatory. This is four of them, I think, uh, if I can remember correctly. And then they found this door at the back of the lavatory, which led down into a cellar, which had stairs leading down to, into a cellar. So these, by the 20th, um, these people, uh, Tony D Dean Drummond and uh, the others, have been in this lavatory um, with the Germans occupying the house as well for three nights. And so uh, he is um, somebody who doesn't really get much of a shake in the movie, but across the whole um of the story of the battle i think exemplifies the determination to try and overcome the problems and, and against the odds but he he basically on this night uh, of the 20th is thinking how am i going to get out of this the germans are in the house i can hear them firing from the house we're in we're in a lavatory trying to stop the coming through the door eating the apples 
uh, sorry, down in the cellar below the lavatory, eating the apples that are stored there. And once the house gets quiet, I think we'll try and make a break for it. And uh, that's what he's thinking mm. on the 20th. So he illustrates the, I would say, the what you talked about earlier, the, the end of this phase, because the battle has these phases yeah. of, trying to, of the whole division or brigades trying to get through to the bridge. And I think you make a good point there, Ian, about yeah. the fact that I think from, from from other books, from documentaries and the films, there's there's a feeling amongst some people now that once there was an, an acceptance of the, some of the things had gone wrong, there was a resignation. Oh, well, that's it then. Mm. Like, you know, the mm. fact the Jeeps didn't make it to the bridge from Recce Corps. Well, you were talking about the fact that they were trying to send carriers there to reinforce the bridge. In You know, oh, well, the radios don't work. Oh, well, they don't work. And the fact is you're trying to get across and you do get across. They're still trying to get communications going. They're trying to yeah. find solutions. And if plan A doesn't work, try plan B, plan C and plan D. And I think that has been lost in the armor narrative a little bit. That There had been things going wrong, but there are people actively continually trying to rectify those errors, trying to improve communications, trying to keep on getting there. Mm. And I think that has been lost generally. That it, it Again, it goes back to this idea that within a few hours, just goes back to defensive and, and they're almost helpless now in the situation. It's all about them just clinging on and holding on. And I think the reverse is true, that they are... They, they may be in a vulnerable situation, but they are still actively trying to fight their way, work their way out of the situation by establishing communications, by getting new undiscovered routes towards the bridge, by linking houses together, by finding other ways of getting to each other, uh, hiding out if they can until they can get a chance to move on and move back. And, and I think that gets lost because, again, it comes back to what we were saying at the beginning. By studying the battle from the overview, from the, the arrows on maps view, you see, well, that lot stopped. Again, by doing it from the point of view of the people, the individuals, you get much more of a sense of this absolute determination to keep on persevering. I think that's what we're trying to do today, in fact. On yeah, the yeah, yeah. And I think also, I think on the, by the, the certainly by the 20th in the morning of the 20. Uh, and the day of the twenty first, then of course the, the 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 next phase, you know, there's the the there's the people at the bridge, and by the twenty first, I think that battle's uh, not going into it here, but I do in the book. That battle is is all but over. Um, but the the other phase now is the fragmentation of uh, the attempt to get through to the the road bridge and the failure to capture the railway bridge because that was blown up. Uh, they then come into this next phase, uh, which is where the civilians. Uh, from yeah. the 20th onwards, start to sense that actually this operation is doomed, it is lost, uh, that we're actually, we did think we were being liberated, but actually that's not going to happen, we don't think. And it then becomes a question of when is when is Second Army going to arrive? When is 30 Corps going to arrive? When are they going to get here? And so it's this idea that you're hanging on to um, enable that link up to come across another point across the river elsewhere. So that becomes the next phase is to create this perimeter, obviously, and that's where Ustabek comes into it. And the civilians, thousands of them who are in, have been in the town of Arnhem and in Ustabek itself, are then caught up in it in their cellars, you know, below the battle. So there's the two levels: the civilians below the battle in their cellars, and then the battle above that rages in their neighbourhoods and destroys their homes and everything. So that then, of course, brings me in my narrative back to Franz de So and in Jan Luce as well. So, I mean, that, that then enabled uh, me on the 20th, certainly on the 21st, apart from telling the story of one or two other people who had been uh, cut off from, from their forces, like uh, Staff Sergeant Pat Whit Withnell, glider pilot regiment, who, who came in with the poles on their lift and then was basically cut off from, from his own side because the poles he was carrying got into their, their Jeep and they drove off and then he heard machine gun fire, he and his, his uh, co-pilot, and, uh, and realised they'd been killed. So then he spends the next few days wandering the woods. So there are troops still not linking up with their own units, wandering the woods. There's the civilians in the cellars, and then there's the what's being pulled together uh, of the division to hold this perimeter so that the uh, Second Army can get across the river. So uh, at this point, this is when um, I change the story to, to what happens uh, with, the, with the people in the perimeter mainly uh, holding the perimeter and also the civilians and that's that enabled me to put in some incredible um, eyewitness testimony from from that uh, I wouldn't say unknown but that relatively um, untold perspective that is the the Dutch people 
who were right. And the, the thing that comes across from your accounts of the Dutch people, and perhaps also Dilip Sarkar, who's joining us later in the week, yeah. is that there is, because for those who are watching who've never been to this part of the Netherlands, it is today and was then quite prosperous. You're talking about a, a generally kind of middle class area. Yeah, these are people who've traveled, they've been to universe, yeah. they've, yeah. they've, they're business people. I mean, if you compare it to some of rural Normandy where it's farmers, you know, a long journey for them was five miles to the market to sell their wares. And so there's a sense amongst the Dutch civilians that comes across of a much, I would think, a greater awareness of the war in its context there. They're listening to BBC, they're understanding. I think perhaps, therefore, the Dutch civilians around Arnhem are seeing the writing on the wall sooner because of that world experience they've had, perhaps. And it's quite quite urban in a sense, isn't it? You know, you'd, the whispers would have moved quite quickly from the centre of Arnhem to Oosterbeek to the other places around there, the whiskers, because life was still going on. That's the weird thing about the battle, you know, in terms of the telephones, in some cases were still oh, yeah. working. There's still kind of a postal yeah. service in a yeah. weird way. And so yeah. the Dutch are still trying to get about their own business because the, the battle is concentrated in these very fierce pockets. But two or three miles away, you could be relatively quiet from things. Yes. And so... That, that Dutch experience, I think, is vital for us 77 years on to understand the flow of the battle. And it's vital to get across, again, this idea of just how how um, awful the beginning of their winter was becoming by now. Because that's the thing about the, the civilians as well, is, is that if, if you're aiding an allied soldier and then the battle ends and the Germans are there, you're, you're in potential danger of being shot and your family's being shot. If you're a British paratrooper and you are captured, we know yeah. that they were taken to prisoner war camps and, and they were treated with, with dignity and respect. And that's another aspect, the danger level to the Dutch civilian of the impending fate that could be theirs and did you sense that when you're reading and translating these articles oh, yeah. that they are very yeah. much aware of what the outcome yeah. could be yeah i mean i you know going a little bit out of the chronology just to talk about franz de so and his because uh, he had his wife and um his baby daughter down in the cellar and also uh there are about 20 civilians there and at one stage he had to keep other civilians from coming in during a bombardment because he just didn't have room for them because one of the things they had was food supplies down there particularly pickled uh, stuff and um so he he realized that they couldn't sustain that number of people and he didn't want panic so he had to send them to another cellar in the middle of this bombardment it's quite an extraordinary passage but the thing about him was that he was uh, multilingual so as soon as the British troops arrived, and he was a great admirer of them and, you know, was really pulling for the, the British to hold on, of course, like the Dutch people would be, um, he would be thinking in English and talking to them in English. And he became, uh, you talk about a collaboration that could be dangerous later on when the battle ends, because we knew that via hindsight. Um, he he uh, collaborated with the British um, forces. At one stage, he went to see... Uh, I think a, a, either a battalion or a company headquarters to try and help out. And then he was using the phone system we talk about to ring other people in other parts to find out what the Germans were doing there. So he was already taking a risk and uh, he had quite a substantial and comfortable home there, you know, um, a posh house, you know, in a, as you say, a posh suburb. And uh, it became the centre of his battle, of his nation's battle. So he was in the cellar and then the, the, the paratroopers and the airborne were above. And it was the same for Jan Luce as well with his, his sister and his mother with a few neighbours uh, a few yards down the road in another cellar. And but for, for the um, the house of uh, Franz de Sert, he actually went up to see the paratroopers. And at one stage, uh, with one of the NCOs uh, that was in the house, went up into the attic uh, with a gun alongside him and through a hole that had been created, uh, probably by shell fire or some explosion, um, he um, he was sniping as best as he could, uh, having been given a quick lesson by the NCO, uh, sniping at the Germans. He was actually shooting at them. And so, I mean, to think if the Germans had found out about that, he would have been shot immediately. And then later on, when, when things uh, were finally closing in and they could hear uh, um, self-propelled guns and tanks moving around and the battle raging above them around the house when they were down in the cellar, um, he went up. Uh, near the end of it to uh, help reinforce his own house, which was being dismantled. You know, the bathroom's been taken out, the bath's falling down, 
through on, onto the ground floor. But then the, the final, as yes, the final stand in the house came for the British, he went up there and willingly got um, uh, furniture, like, you know, uh, pianos prized pianos and put them up in areas or put furniture against uh, windows doors helped them reinforce his own house which was being dismantled and then when the battle was done um and they're down in the cellar and the house has been sort of almost reduced to rubble but there's they're still okay you can hear german voices uh, through the cellar the, the street door for the cellar and he immediately, um, when they, his baby uh, cries out a little bit, so the Germans fling open the cellar doors and call them up, call all the civilians up. Um, and Franz de So immediately switches in his mind to German and to thinking in German and speaking German. And the first thing that the uh, their Wehrmacht uh, soldiers, the first thing they ask him is, are there any British down there? You know, what have you been doing with them? And he, he's very careful to say that no, no, there are no British down there. I mean, they did find some British in his house. But he then made sure that he moved everybody off and away down the street, and the fighting was still going on. And through his garden, which was a complete, you know, absolute mess of shambles with dead bodies and a dead horse, and uh, there was sort of wreckage everywhere. And so that those, those people, uh, whether it was Jan or uh, Franz, you know, and their families, they, they paid the penalty actually during the battle. Uh, as we're getting a bit ahead of the the uh, um, the chronology, but they certainly paid the battle for having uh, two, as, as Franz de Soe described it, uh, two superpowers of the day slugging it out in their neighbourhood. And, mm -hmm. and his story and Jan's stories are absolutely incredible. They are, and it, again, it, it's that connection between the Dutch and the British uh, in Arnhem yeah. that is, it's not unique to battlefields, but when you think no. of Italy or Normandy or Sicily, it's mostly companies and battalions moving through, but, it, you know, it, it became very territorial in Arnhem because you have literally a section of men defending two houses in yeah. one street, and they're there for several days, and it's the same Dutch people, the same British people, yeah. and, and they're now invested in this 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 battle that they don't know the outcome of and they're both players in it and the connections and we you know any any british veteran will tell you our american or canadian about the welcome they get when they go back to the, the areas now and these deep yeah. family connections between it was my yeah. grandfather who's looking after your grandfather and you know, that's that's something that's quite unique to arnhem and again gets lost if you only look at that narrative of the the operation failing at a kind of brigade level, which is so often the way Market Garden is examined. And, 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 it, and it's interesting examining Market Garden from that, you know, tabletop wargaming scenario. But I think it's more interesting looking at this human, this human yeah, encounter. Yeah. And I, I, um, uh, I mean, my background is, you know, it's a new years ago, I was, I was a newspaper reporter. It was, yeah. it's all about people. You know, if you go and do uh, cover, crown court or magistrates court and you you cover all the various uh, activities and antics of people and you learn about society and if you are out there in the community getting stories you're talking to policemen you might talk to criminals whatever you get stories you know you talk to all sorts of people and it's the human interest stories as you say but i mean by going back to the battle by the 22nd of september and this is a, this is a story that i was thinking about when you're talking about the bond between the dutch people and the, the paratroopers one of the stories that harry tucker so Corporal Harry Tucker, uh, this incredible uh, paratrooper, has has uh, retreated from the town. He's uh, been rallied um, at the church and that famous rallying uh, call that was given. And he's been sent out into the perimeter with three or four uh, soldiers uh, to uh, that he knows and doesn't know, you know, a group, a motley group, to defend a house. So they're now in their house. And um, there are Dutch civilians in the cellar. And Harry told me this. Uh, amazing story uh, which illustrates uh, how the Dutch have come to admire the British and also the humanity that you can find amid that, which was that they were basically fending off uh, the Waffen-SS attacks or soldiers from the Waffen-SS coming forward, you know, in forays against, against their house, uh, uh, Corporal Tucker and three or four other paratroopers. But then this uh, young uh, Dutch girl appears uh, from the cellar with a, a, a plate of apples, I think it was apples, and um, offers those around. And then she says to to Harry, um, I need to um, water my horse. I need to go out in, in the, into the barn and water my horse. And Harry goes, well, you're not going out there because they'll kill you. You know, there's gunfire going. And she says, oh, I'm, I've got to go. I've got to go and, and water the horse. I'm worried about the horse. So he relents, incredibly relents. And he says, okay. And so he goes out the back door. 
and uh, leads her across the uh, the backyard or the garden towards the barn. And he says that actually the firing in that strict locality stopped and the Germans themselves stopped firing and were just watching, thinking, what the heck is this? And, you know, didn't shoot them and didn't kill them. And so they went into this barn and she was able to water a horse and then come back um, into the house safely and go back into the cellar. And it, you, you think, well, it must be gestures like that and events like that would really would uh, make you uh, beloved of uh, the local Dutch people, but also showed the common kind of humanity and care for animals that um, the British have. Um, and um, But then, you know, around that time and not long after, you know, the battle starts again for Harry's house. And um, there's a, a German, a bit like the incident with General Urquhart, where um, the German appears at the window of a house and is shot through the window by the general and two other officers, in fact. I think one other officer, sorry. In fact, it's in the book. But there's a similar incident with Harry Tucker in that a German appears at the window of the house that he's in and um, he gets told to get down by his mate who then blasts or, or blasts this German through the window. So the battle would stop for these bizarre um, episodes and there were bizarre events throughout it where the fighting would stop or things would happen between the two sides and then it would just sort of resume its savagery and uh, the intensity of combat. But I think the, the human element, the small detail, such as uh, that um, that incident with the horse where Harry takes the young girl out towards the horse is, for me, the secret to unlocking a story and illustrating the sort of paradox of war, but also the humanity at the centre of it. No, absolutely. It, it, yeah. it, again, it, it's we're, we're repeating ourselves, but it's that it's the it's the level of of viewpoint you take at this battle, and if you look at it from the ground up, it becomes a very different um, picture than it does if you look at it from the operational level down. These 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 moments of, of of contact, you know. I mean, I think anybody who studied that battle, you know, in my case, I read about the airborne reconnaissance squadron. and Neil's read about the the, the medical battalions. Everybody who's read about it has these little stories of humanity and and people going back to. I, I know a particular story of a guy. You know, he'd been firing a Brennan gun out a window when he left. He stood the vase up on the mantelpiece again, and he kind of straightened things out before leaving. Because there was this sense that you're, you know, you're still in a, you're, you're still a guest of these Dutch people, even though you're fighting a battle there. There was a, yeah. and it seemed ridiculous, you know, bothering to straighten something there before you run away. But I think it, yeah. it, it exemplifies the, the the respect and 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 this kind of. It was representing what they were fighting for. They were fighting for normality in the middle of this. So, so somehow setting a painting straight and making sure the vase was standing up before you left was important to their to their morale in the middle. We're not going to let this become just a, a training establishment where we don't care about the outcome. These are people's houses. Yeah. These are people there. I I care about their property. I care about their their horse. In in the case of yeah. Harry, there, and, and it's it's important to get those stories across. Yeah. And there were, there were, I mean, just to digress a little bit on the humanity side of it, and on the on the German side as well, there were sort of strange and um, surprising episodes of um, of almost, you know, cordiality or just humanity. I mean, people have this idea of of the German side, let's say, being monolithic, and I'm not saying they weren't tough and they weren't hard soldiers, because obviously they were. A lot of them, some of them weren't, some of them were. Most of them were, um, let's say, that fought in this battle. But there's, the, you know, there's a bit where um, there's three bits that spring to mind, um, where uh, a British soldier, I think it's from the second battalion at the bridge, the, the road bridge. Um, I think it's an officer. It's in the book. He he sits down with after the battle and is surrendered with a Waffen SS uh, soldier who offers round uh, cigars and says, "Let's have a cigar." It was a it was a good fight we've just had, you know, and you're thinking, well, it's, you know, he's showing some admiration for them and um, a bit of humanity that maybe in stereotypical portrayal, uh, that sort of thing wouldn't happen. Although it seems a bit cliched in some ways, it did actually happen. But when it comes again to the Dutch civilians, the two things which I think show that, although they were treated very harshly in the aftermath of the battle um, by, by the German occupiers terribly, uh, there were signs uh, that some people uh, took some pity or showed them some sympathy. And the two episodes that stick in my mind are when uh, Jan, 14-year-old Jan Luce, is uh, leaving his destroyed neighbourhood. He um, is walking down the street and there's a German, a Waffen-SS uh, soldier in front of him 
but it was really tough, very, very formidable. And uh, he, he wonders, you know, uh, Jan wonders what's going to happen here. The German says to him, and I'm, I'm abbreviating here, he says, um, you know, how old are you? And he says, well, you know, I'm 14. He says, oh, okay. And he, he digs in his, uh, digs into a pocket or a bag and pulls out, uh, I think, a bar of chocolate and some stale bread and gives it to him and basically says, you know, get out of here. Uh, and don't come back or you'll be shot. So it's that kind of strange mixture of um, showing a bit of humanity and empathy and also warning him, you know, you better you better stay out of here. And then when um, uh, Franz de Soot and his wife and the baby are making their exit from the battlefield, they come across a house where there's a load of German soldiers having a rest because they're exhausted. And there's a load of bicycles uh, arrayed around the outside of the house. And, and Franz is thinking, well, the baby could do with, you know, we could do with putting the baby on the handlebars and somehow getting a bit bored or something and put put the baby on then wheel her along. Um, and when they go into this house, they sit down and there's a single German soldier there at the table and I think they have a drink. Uh, I have to read the book again to see see what's going on there. But he says that they they sat down with this German and uh, had a brief discussion with him about about things. And uh, and then Franz asks, "Have you got any bicycles you can let us have?" And this soldier says, no, we can't let you have any of our bicycles. But there's a British one. There's an airborne uh, British cycle that was dropped in and the, the, the enemy were using. You can have that. And so he gives him the bicycle and off they go on their odyssey away from the battlefield across across that part of Holland to escape the fighting. And so I think that showed also uh, common humanity and sympathy as well that was on the other side. Uh, obviously not the same because, of course, they were the occupiers and the oppressors and the the British and the Poles uh, and others were coming to liberate, of course. But again, it does get across this idea that in an environment like that, whether you're German or British, yeah. in this close quarters urban combat, you're seeing tactical prowess being displayed by the enemy. You're seeing them as weary as you are. You're all sort of water. You're all sort of knowing where your, your unit is because the Germans got all mixed up in it as well. They aren't fighting coherently. I mean, they're, we now know by the 21st, 22nd, which we are in the, in the narrative, I guess, at this yeah. point, the battle has turned now. It's it's kind of yeah. going to end one way yeah. now, although perhaps on the ground you're not aware of that. But the Germans yeah. are still in a very fraught situation. They they don't know I, equally when the when and if the reinforcement. They know there's all this stuff happening down the road at Nijmegen and Eindhoven, and that they don't know the outcome either. So if you if you're seeing your your enemy display qualities of good soldiering, mm. you, you know the way to train soldiers is you know you run them down the yeah, the, the the with the bayonet on your rifle towards the target there, but it's all about keeping it. It's not a person; it's a target. It's like as Lee Marvin says in a big red one: "We're not murdering people; yeah. we're killing. We're killing enemy soldiers." But the more you've made eye contact with them, the more you've seen them across the street there, because it was street to street, as we know in Arnhem. And you know, you, I remember the guys I spoke to; they they got to know. Oh, there's that tall German that always in the top window there. There's a little short one. Is always they could smell when they're smoking their pipes and their cigarettes and, and they yeah. could smell when they're cooking their rations. Of course, there's going to develop some kind of, I'm not saying sympathy, but empathy and understanding and, and respect, I think for, for, for either side, for the other. It's not a, it, there are some nasty incidents that happen there, but a lot of the, the, the stories out of Arnhem are of, I think of, um, of, of mutual respect um, at, at least soldier to soldier, as you as you elaborate on the Dutch civilian experience, particularly after battle changes. But so we just we, so in, in terms of the, chrono, the chronological aspect of it, we are kind of we're over the tipping point now. So the last few days, things things become the lines become more stable, and I think the outcome becomes clearer for everybody concerned that it is now just a, a waiting game. But it, when you again speak into the veterans, at this kind of point there, did, do you think they were as a one resigned to their fate by this, or do you still think there was elements of hope? No, I think there was there were definitely elements of hope. I mean, if you're – I think often it depends upon are you – are you with people you know? Are you in a situation where you feel you've got some kind of contact and support with somebody? So somebody like uh, Sergeant Staff Sergeant Withnall, who had come in on his glider and was just two of him and his co-pilot had uh, come in on this glider and they were um, dropping off the poles. The poles disappear. They're, they're killed. And then they think, well, what do we do next? Do we go down to the river and we've got to get back to the UK eventually? Or do we link up with somebody? So they... Uh, at this at this time in the battle, they're 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 different from Harry. I mean, Harry is isolated in his house. He's he's there with his 
he's three or four uh, comrades in arms and he's, the Dutch people are down below. So he knows where he is in the perimeter. He knows what, what he's fighting for. And that's, I guess, who he's fighting for. But then you'll have someone like uh, Pat, who then became separated from, from his uh, co-pilot. And he's wandering the woods and, and trying to get moisture, living off uh, you know the moisture of blades of grass and hearing tanks churn around um, out there. And he's, he's completely disconnected. So quite a few people were, I think, doing that, wandering around, trying to figure out what to do. And he ends up uh, on, a, on a trail and sees these people step out onto it and they turn out to be Germans. So in a way, I suppose he's uh, not happy about being captured, but in a way it's a relief for him to be captured. But then you have other people like Harry and people who are maybe in, in other parts of uh, the perimeter or within it, like at the Hartenstein, um, who are still determined to fight on and are still going out and trying to make patrols. And they are, they, I think they do hope that the Second Army and Third Corps will make it and they will get across the river at, uh, at the point where they are now, not the bridges, but across the river that way. And, uh, but you know, you have people like Captain Peter Fletcher going out on patrols around this time. Uh, and um, again, story, this story that he told me was that you know, he was going around uh, cheering people up and saying, uh, you know, we'll be all right. You know, 30 Corps get here, the Second Army is going to. You know, savers and he said that in his head he had a greek chorus of we're doomed but he wouldn't let on to his soldiers uh, that that was going to happen and then uh, at around this time he was asked um by somebody to go and assemble a group and attack a german tank um which i think was they say a tiger tank but i think every every tank became a tiger every tank is always a tiger tank yeah. <laughs> in the middle of autumn. and he was told to gather these people together and he gathered this group together and they were like you know um, thinking, right, well, this is great. And they had rifles. They were running out of ammunition, but they had rifles and uh, a few weapons. So they go off and he says, right, we're, we're not going to uh, make a death or glory attack on these guys. We're going to um, we're going to fire at them and that'll be it. We've done our bit. And that's what they did. And one, I think a couple of them were killed and then they withdrew and they reported back they'd done it. But then, you know, so uh, Harry was in his house and the tanks uh, were you know roaming around and he was still... He, using his, I think he, by then he'd come across uh, an M1, a carbine of some kind, and he was taking pot shots at uh, Panzer Cruise and uh, risking being um, blown to pieces when they 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 realised where he was. And another guy that I interviewed, um, Lord Lance Corporal Dennis Clay, who was in the Royal Army Service Corps at this time, um, he was in in houses that were being demolished by what must have really been target tanks, I should think. And he described to me how they would uh, they would find them coming into the rooms, you know, and demolishing the rooms. And they had to flee from room to room. And so there was a lot of determined fighting going on on the, the perimeter at this time. And they were determined to hold on. And, and it was, as you know, there was a bit of humour in that as well with the Germans taunting the British fire um, broadcasts, playing virulent records to try and upset the Brits and having a peer... Uh, round fired back at it to destroy the speaker system and trading insults um, and trying to get um, people's morale destroyed if they could. And I don't think on either side psychological warfare particularly worked uh, via loudspeakers or cutting into radio transmissions and insulting the commanding officer. So I think there was a lot of training of insults, a few humorous moments, people trying to find food because food was running low and basically trying to conserve their ammunition to hang on. Uh, until the second army got there but again very fragmented at this point yes. and again again by looking at it you know the people are looking at the map of the perimeter with the, the various yeah, elements yeah, around that, um, it yeah. seems organized and at a high level i mean by this point urkel of course is back and that there is yeah. a command structure in yeah. place and it does it has got an organized element to it and yet it's still at the at the corporal private individual groups of three and yes. four still very fragmented and everybody's situation is slightly different and and it becomes when you're assembling accounts, you know, you, you, how many do you put in to kind of get across that yeah. level of confusion? Because they're, they're all different, the stories, but they're all similar in the sense they are conveying that idea of, OK, yeah, we're, we're kind of doing our bit now in this little environment. But we're part of a greater good there. And of course, we now know that the 30 Corps are probably not yeah. going to get there and, um, and ammunition yeah. is going to yeah. run out. And the Germans have 
just about been able to really sort of establish themselves and they, they know where they are and they know where their reinforcements coming from and and it, it, it yeah the writing is on the wall so so run yeah. us through the last three or four days or three or four days and we'll, we'll kind of round things off I th yeah i mean i think i think that the as you say thing uh, the phases you know the, the various phases um of the battle and we haven't even covered some of the the other ones but i mean the various phases that you have we're now at that, that stage as, as you say where the vice is tightening you know the the which is cauldron is having all the fire poured into it and uh they've still got access to the rhine but it's been becoming difficult to to hang on and on the on the 24th um i mean there was an attempt by uh, another chap that um, I found, uh, this was why the Imperial War Museum Sound Archive was Lieutenant Colonel Martin Herford uh, was um, a officer in the Royal uh, Army Medical Corps in charge of a field ambulance. So one of the things I started thinking about was all the wounded uh, that need to be got out and could they arrange them to come across the river uh, and could, or, you know, what would happen with them, you know, when, when the Germans captured them. So he was an incredible guy who had a lot of experiences in the Spanish Civil War and also in the winter war in Finland. And he just, he asked if he could go across the river because he could speak German, talk to the Germans about getting wounded, if, if evacuated across the river. And by that time, um, this was the 24th, by that time, the lead elements of Summer 30 Corps had come up to the river, uh, the, um, the Wessex uh, division. And um, so he and a volunteer uh, called Captain Percy Louie, whose family I actually know, are friends of mine, uh, they gave me a little bit on on his what happened to him because we, it's a bit of a mystery, really. And this this brings in something else that I think is uh, a very interesting aspect of Arnhem as well. But anyway, um, Louie and uh, Martin Herford, Captain Percy Louie and Lieutenant Colonel Herford are these two two people that go across the river and try to make contact with the Germans to get the wounded out. Now, Captain Louis left with some medics after they go across in a small boat on, on the beach of the Rhine while Herford goes off to try and find somebody to negotiate with. And uh, he ends up uh, basically being taken, Herford ends up being taken prisoner. At one point, thinks he's going to be shot um, and uh, doesn't get back across, but in the end helps with the care of, of the wounded and the prisoners in... Um, in captivity at the end of the battle. Now, Captain uh, Louis, he uh, goes back across the river when Herford doesn't come back and then joins up with a further attempt to get medical supplies across and help out. But somehow during this process, and I go into it a bit more in the book, he ends up being killed. Now, uh, Captain Louis was a veteran of Dunkirk uh, as well and was also Jewish. And he, if presumably, I mean, this is the way it would it would appear, you know, in history, if the Germans had captured him, found out he was of the Jewish uh, religion, then um, he would possibly be killed or treated differently. But there were a lot of people who were um, Jewish who were fighting uh, with the uh, Glider Pilot Regiment, with the 21st Independent Company of the Parachute Regiment uh, the, of the Division, and also elsewhere, who were A, German or Austrian, B, Jewish, and had these cover names, as we know, uh, anybody mm. reads into it knows they were all given cover names and, and cover stories. But of course, Captain Louis was British, you know, he's from, from Britain, uh, he's a British national. So that's an aspect of the battle which I found fascinating and I thought it was well worth drawing attention to was that. And also, there were, there were, there were some um, uh, black soldiers with the independent company and elsewhere as well in the battle. So those are like details. But the, when it comes to uh, Captain Louis and the attempt to get the medical supplies across, I thought it was in, uh, interesting and worth conveying um, that side of it as well, because it illustrates how, as you say, the battle changes from trying to get the bridges to trying to assemble a perimeter to get the army across to thinking, how do we get, how do we salvage the situation? How do we get the wounded out? And then negotiations that fail to get the wounded out. And then the Germans think, right, we, we're going to close in now. And so, uh, you know, the 25th um, is, is well, the final bit. I mean, that, in fact, that's the day when Captain Louis came across and was killed. And as I've called it 10 days in the cauldron, uh, not nine days, because um, which I suppose the accepted uh, span of the battle uh, is nine days. But I thought for uh, my book, Arnhem, 10 days in the cauldron was good because I took it from the 25th into the 26th and then beyond. 
so I just thought I'd go for the round number. So, um, uh, and, and, I, and and of course, when do you end the battle? Because as yeah. we know, Operation Pegasus happens. Yeah. There's, you know, yes. there's the other people who are caught up, and there's that. We yeah. did a program on World War Two TV with Edwin explaining all the routes back, and the, the, and he had all the houses and, and yeah. plotted where Dutch people were looking after. And that's another element that you we could elaborate on is that despite the events of the germans now pressing in and and they did kind of crank up their ruthlessness towards the end of the germans as you said there there were the british are kind of looking at maybe trying to salvaging a sort of dunkirk out of it how can we get people out and the germans are like no no you've had you've had every compassion we're going to get now it's now they're just going to turn the screws and, and and have this overwhelming victory and you can understand from the german point of view because the tide of war is going against them and and I go. I suppose they want to now really claim this one as theirs and say, okay, yeah, we've resoundingly crushed this this airborne bridgehead. And I can kind of understand that, but it, it, at the same time, the Dutch are still still loyally um, working alongside the British and 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 still trying to do their best because of these connections they've established. And and I'm, I'm glad, you know, again, you get across the fact there are black troops and Jewish troops because it's an yeah. in, interesting aspect of the British army that it's, it is made up of all sorts of people from different backgrounds and different ancestries. And, and, and again, the, the movies, not just Bridge Too Far, but all of them, it's very, it's very white only. And, and we yeah. know the Hollywood movies, there's never anybody who is, they're either the British are either the Cockneys or, uh, or upper yeah. class. I mean, the seventies yeah, yeah. things a bit, there's the Geordie, yeah. isn't there? Alan Armstrong yeah. is, the, uh, is the, the Geordie in the film. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, Don't forget but, the Celts. We've got to get the Celts. Yeah, the Celts. Yeah. The, the, so, you know, it, it is a, it is a diverse like, group of people, yeah, but yeah. yeah. Bringing things to an end in terms of the battle and yeah. in terms of your book and in terms of this show, how did you approach the conclusion of a book about Arnhem? Because, and again, without going into the the blame mm -hmm. game, and how, how did you tackle that denouement of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, apart from the, the, the end of the battle itself, uh, I, I looked at uh, that, but I then looked at the uh, the civilians and what happened to them afterwards as they made their, their pilgrimage away from the immediate battle zone, you know, an area that was declared a no-go zone became the front line between uh, the Allied armies and the Germans, kept out, lost their homes. A lot of them had their homes pillaged, ruined, you know, uh, further ruined in pillaging when they demolished the Germans looking for valuables or just basically told you can't come back, stay out. I won't go into too much detail there, but that was quite a, quite a saga. And some of them were even attacked by mistake by Allied aircraft as they tried to get away and they were treated you know quite abominably and had to go and live like refugee well they were refugees not like refugees in in strangers homes so there was that side then there's the airborne diaspora which is uh, people like frank newhouse a private in the 10th Pratchett battalion who was uh, wounded uh, captured um, and then sent to a prison war camp like many others uh, of the first airborne division uh in in germany or or so they were in poland i guess uh as well yes they were yeah and um and he ended up in a camp near, near dresden and so uh, towards the end of the war when the bombing of dresden came along he was actually sent in to clear up uh some of the the uh the rubble and also the the, the corpses and the bodies what was left of people at dresden and at one stage one of his um fellow soldiers was executed by the germans and he'd had to dig the grave of that that guy canadian um before the execution so he, he had a whole range of other experiences in captivity and he ended up like many others in making his own way back and including harry tucker as well who escaped twice so so people like harry corporal tucker and private newhouse had their own odyssey uh, as the war ended and so newhouse went on this kind of journey into uh, across um the, uh, czechoslovakia and ended up getting um, walking to freedom that way and getting given a car by the Americans so that he and his fellow airborne soldiers could drive to, uh, I think, um, France, something like that. And then Harry, he escaped from a, uh, a camp and ended up wandering around and met up with some French, um, I call them slave workers, I guess that's what they were, who'd also escaped and um, meeting the americans and he got home that way there's a whole story in the book for those two about their amazing adventures um but then apart from that that's the human side of it the aftermath um i also decided that i would try and convey sum up bookend it with um with whether or not 
it was a, a wise venture because I start the book with a look at the uh, the Pegasus Bridge assault because that was a uh, you know you might say the perfect result or the perfect mission um, of uh, you know landing right on top of a bridge and also capturing it and et cetera, et cetera. But there was very different, very different circumstances, which explain why that gamble, uh, that audacious move could pay off and very different from uh, moving a division, uh, you know, 60 miles behind enemy lines and then getting to a bridge from those landing zones and drop zones eight miles away. And so I look a little bit at how the generals uh, felt, Horrocks and Urquhart and the Brigadier, Brigadier Hackett and John Frost, I've sort of, drawn together their reflections uh, nearer the time and at further distance and also people like Zeno who was a paratrooper in the 21st independent company I drew a few quotes out from him because I mean he was there he fought on that so I used one or two of his quotes and a few other soldiers to then look at that uh, that whole thing at the end you know was it worth it etc and should they have just <laughs> dropped a load of people on the bridge so I'm you know I'm not going to give any verdict on that here but if people want to read that I thought I'd do that as well, just to sum up. And that way it's all And, and that, you know, as we said right at the top of the show, and it, it ends up becoming opinions in a sense, yeah. doesn't it? You know, and you could sit 10 yeah. military authors, historians, and YouTube channel hosts in a pub and say, okay, what went wrong? And they'd agree on some things and they'd yeah. di completely disagree on others. And it's an eternal question that I think will never be asked. Was it, was it worth it? Might mm -hmm. it have gone better? Might it not yet? Because you only have to change a couple of little things here and a couple of little things there, yeah. and the domino effect can very quickly take it the other way. And as we discussed with the, on the show with James Daly about the cancelled operations, there's no point doing something that isn't audacious with airborne forces. You don't have yeah. them doing something that any old group of truck drivers could do. The, the point is you've spent a lot of money sharpening this spear for something very, very brilliant use of them, something dynamic, something risk-taking, because the goal, the objective has to be a big, look, if we do this, we will get the Ruhr. It probably would have brought the war to a conclusion before Christmas, maybe. So yeah. it had to be ambitious. It had to be ambitious, and it didn't work. And, and of course, I think we. I want to leave this show and essentially the same way you leave the book, although you do do this kind of wrap-up, it's yeah. the human experience is important. Yeah. And, and, and the fact that the Arnhem veterans we knew spent the rest of their lives considering if they'd done that, if this had been that, that, that it was something they were tormented by, I think as well. Some of them well, they, yeah. and they're dealing with the fact they lost their friends. I can examine it purely as a, the counterfactual problem on the war gaming tab and go, but, yeah. but I didn't lose any friends there, you know, who are yeah. guys I'd spent a year living beside, you know, this some hut kind of thing. So, that's the ultimate thing we need to respect is that these guys who were there were burdened by that as well. And their and their survivors' guilt and their perhaps their individual thinking, maybe I should have done a bit more. Maybe on that first day when there was a pause, I should have told my officer, why don't we push on a bit more, sir? Everyone's yeah, yeah. gonna question themselves about their about their own participation, I would think. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, it has to come down to the human element and what the people thought and how did they feel after the battle. And we could argue about it. And, you know, I, I put a bit of that in. Uh, of course, you know, I've got a whole chapter on it and I try to put it in in the narrative wherever it's needed. But I think um, lots of books have been done about that. And I wanted to give something that um, would have a dose of that, would have an element of that, 20, 30 percent of that. But I really wanted to give it from the point of view of those soldiers I met who I felt had never never had their story told outside of the supplement I did for a newspaper, which was on sale for a day, then disappeared, and others I could find in the archives that maybe a little bit unusual or, or hadn't been used that much. So that was my aim. And, of course, the Dutch civilians, for me, uh, are the arbiters of was it worth it. I know that I reckon, you know, the airborne soldiers would, you know, having got over the bitter failure, et cetera, and of the years, they would, pro they would say, of course, they would do it again. And they would hope there would be that one factor, as you said, that would turn out better. But uh, Jan Luce, um, certainly before the pandemic uh, began, was still giving um, battlefield um, tours. And if I can get over there, then he and I will, will meet up, hopefully. Um, and he says that he recalls that, and I'm looking at uh, text from my book here, that veterans would frequently ask of the Dutch hosts when they go back over the years since, since the Second World War, you know, you were all very kind to us 
and we caused you misery and destruction basically by dropping in to try and get those bridges and for him he said um you know he, he could remember it like yesterday and he explained that the bond between the airborne soldiers and the civilians even though there was a lot of destruction and all the rest of it uh came from the fact that the soldiers fought in their gardens and he says uh, to end that part of the book they fought in our houses and they sometimes even fought from room to room while we were sheltering in the basement we suffered together and we saw each other suffering no water no food no sleep we saw them wounded we frequently took care of them one way or the other and we admired them for what they were doing putting their lives at stake for the liberation of the people of a foreign country and i think you know that's that's how i end uh, in fact the book the main narrative before the appendices because i thought jan and the dutch uh, deserved the final word and i you know it's a really sincere uh, feeling from him and i think it sums it up and that's why they do have a special bond and that's why i suppose in a way it was worth it for the division to do that although it was uh, at some cost well and i cannot think of a better way to end this it is in the words of a dutch guy who was there and who's still there it's it's, yeah. it's and it's from my point of view an absolutely perfect way to start off arnhem week and we will be doing a lot more as the week goes on and apologies folks for this one not being a live one but we welcome your comments after the show come and say what you think about it and um, and perhaps ian will respond as well to some comments in the next few days and weeks and uh but right yeah. now it's been great to talk to you ian and as much as i like when we did the bismarck show i read yeah. some naval history i like naval yeah. history to some extent i think you should turn your hand to another ground campaign because you've got a that. very good skill at it you've got a yeah. good way of um of of, of bringing together the various threads and i think uh the naval history's gain is the ground history's <laughs> loss is that well, you I'm spend like, your time doing that but i do have another one for world war ii that would use more of the because I, I did interview lots of soldiers in the 90s for d-day stuff so i'm hoping and also the war thereafter are more airborne soldiers as well uh, towards victory so i'm hoping and one day i'll do one of those books so thanks for for your kind words all oh, right well, Ian, it's been I've been splendid talking to you. And uh, folks, this again, uh, as usual, please check out what we're doing on Patreon. The links to uh, Ian's website, the links to Ian's book, which I do thoroughly recommend, 10 Days in the Cauldron, is in the description below. And I urge you to come back and watch the rest of the shows in Arnhem Week, folks. So this is Paul Woodhouse for World War II TV and Ian Ballantyne saying thank you very much for your company. <laughs>